everyone. Join us today for an enthralling episode as we dive into the world of oral and maxillofacial radiologist with the brilliant Dr. Dania Tamimi. I'm Dr. Tiffany, and you're listening to Jaw Talk. Dr. Tamimi's journey began at King Saud University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where she earned her dental degree, setting the foundation for a remarkable career. She continued her pursuit of excellence at Harvard School of Dental Medicine, where she trained extensively and earned her doctorate of medical science and a prestigious certificate of fellowship in oral and maxillofacial radiology in 2005. Board certified by the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Dr. Tamini's expertise is renowned both nationally and internationally. With her passion for advancing the field, Dr. Tamimi serves as a reviewer and esteemed editorial board member for oral surgery, oral pathology, oral medicine, and oral radiology. Additionally, she lends her expertise as a reviewer for several prominent journals, including DMFR, Oral Radiology, Head and Neck, Angle Orthodontist, and AGODO. Dr. Tamini's contributions to academia extend even further as she is the lead author of two influential textbooks, Specialty Imaging Dental Implants, and my personal favorite, Specialty Imaging Temporomandibular Joint and Sleep Disordered Breathing. Moreover, she's a co-lead author of the renowned Diagnostic Imaging Oral and Maxillofacial. An engaging and sought after speaker, Dr. Tamini shares her knowledge and insights through captivating lectures at both national and international events. Currently, Dr. Tamini runs her own oral and maxillofacial radiology private practice in Orlando, Florida. Stay tuned as we unravel the fascinating world of oral maxillofacial radiology with the accomplished Dr. Dania Tamini. Don't miss this opportunity to gain valuable insights from a true trailblazer in our field. Quick legal disclaimer, all information in this podcast is the opinion of the speakers and not meant to be a substitute for a diagnosis and consultation of a qualified healthcare provider. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Jaw Talk with Dr. Tiffany. I am just thrilled to announce my guest, Dr. Dania Tamimi. You are such a rock star. In fact, I have kind of butterflies in my stomach right now. Just to have you on the podcast is such a dream. I did one of your courses through Beam Readers a couple years ago about CBCT and MRI interpretation. And I just want any dentist out there, if you haven't taken one of her courses, you have to because she's phenomenal. You heard her bio. She's a rock star. And thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your journey. So you've done dental school. Tell us how you got into your specialty, oral maxillofacial radiology. Okay, so I originally wanted to be a physicist. I really wanted to do that as a career. And somehow I ended up in dentistry. And yeah, so from that very first lecture in radiology, I was hooked. I I was like, that's what I want to do. And I love the diagnostic sciences. I really enjoy that thought process, you know. So from that point on, basically, I did everything that I could to get into a radiology program. You know, so I was like preparing myself and studying and and doing all these extra, you know, steps in order for me to be a proficient as a radiologist. That is prior to actually going in to an official program. So when I went to my program at Harvard School of Dental Medicine, I was I was prepared, but of course there was a lot more stuff that I that, that I could possibly imagine. And yeah, so that was fun. Finished that up and here I am. <laughs> yes. And now you're you're a lecturer, you're in education. I want to encourage everyone to get your latest book, which I'm at my lake house right now. And I looked at it and I was like, I kind of want to bring it, but it's so big, but it's just a phenomenal resource. Your new book, Specialty Imaging, Temporomandibular Joints and Sleep Disordered Breathing is just a phenomenal resource to anyone who wants to find out more about airway, the temporomandibular joints. I mean, you even have a chapter on Maja and 4D imaging. How did that yeah. all come <laughs> Well, Well, first of all, here it is. You didn't yes, bring it, but I have it. it. Yeah, okay, I have well, it within. within, within and, th- and this is the reason why Tiffany didn't lug it to to her, her lake house because it's, it's a tomb. It's eight and a half pounds, just like a newborn child. And it, 
you know, I, I guess I was lucky to, to have some amazing mentors come into my life. Yeah. And Dr. Hatcher, Dr. Hatcher right? yeah, Dr. Yeah. Hatcher and others. But prior to that, you know, I always had an interest in how the body all works together. And if I, if, you, if I may, I'll just talk about how my career path shaped to, to what it is right now. And that is, while I was in dental school, and even while I was doing my radiology program, I was also I had a parallel career in fitness. So okay. I was a Pilates instructor, a yoga instructor, I still am, you know, but I don't teach as much as I used to. And spinning, you name it, I did it, you know. So I had this interest in how the body is connected to one another and how it works together, you know, human kinematics and all that stuff and biomechanics. And so at some point I had to make a, a choice because I was teaching 10 classes a week in addition to doing my radiology residency. And I had to make a choice because I started popping out babies and it was hard <laughs> to maintain both lifestyles and like but look both lives, you know. So, of course, I chose the radiology. And the other, you know, I, I thought, you know, okay, so this is good knowledge to have in my head, but how can I ever bring it together with oral maxillofacial radiology? Well, that came about with David Hatcher, who introduced me to what he knows about the TMJ, his vision of how the TMJ and the airway and all that stuff comes together and how the TMJ affects occlusion, how it affects the airway, how it affects facial growth. And yeah, so that really opened up my eyes to, to that. And he and I wrote the first edition of the book. And it was just an amazing educational experience to be able to sit with him. Of course, he's in Sacramento and I'm here in, in Florida. But, you know, the world of virtual Zoom, you know, that opened up and I was able to, to learn from him, even though he was so far away. And yeah, so... So that's basically how, how that happened. And then COVID came along mm -hmm. and in COVID time, I furthered my education in yoga, got into yoga for PTSD and chronic disease. And part of that is chronic pain. And part of that education, uh, there comes in understanding of once again, how everything is connected to one another and the myofascial lines and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, so the genesis of that me trying to understand how a TMJ issue can actually be a more systemic issue, you know, that, that was, that was a very interesting process. So, yeah, yeah. so here I am. Well, we share that love in common because I'm also a Pilates instructor and I, you know, got introduced to that back when I was a PT and I still just think it's such a phenomenal way of bringing together all of those aspects of breathing and spinal articulation and postural changes that we, you know, see over time with our, our, our bodies as we, you know, different habits or maybe injuries, all of those things come into play. So I encourage all of my TMD patients when they've kind of graduated from me is like, okay, you have to start doing Pilates. Absolutely. And yoga. And certainly, and yoga. I mean, I think the two complement each other very much. Okay. Because whereas Pilates, both disciplines are mind body disciplines and, and both of them are, they work along the myofascial lines and they work to strengthen the core. And, and yeah. but yoga introduces the, the element of relaxation. Okay. Mm -hmm. the relaxation. That's a very important thing to have in order to help people with TMD. The Pilates helps with the posture, but the yoga helps with the mindset. Okay. And then nervous system, some of those. Right. Yeah. And then, so like, let's go back to kind of, you know, your process and like your workflow now. So you're getting referrals from general dentists. Let's say they have a cone beam CT in their office and they're wanting to look at the patient's airway. So tell us like, to me, what I try to do, and I don't know if you love this or not, but I try to give that big comprehensive exam of, you know, as the patient, I, I'm kind of painting a picture for you too, of, you know, kind of what's their history with their joints? What's their pain history? What's their, you know, what trauma have they experienced? Maybe they've had a fall on the chin, or maybe they've had a series of car accidents, or maybe they've had some stretch injury. Maybe they've had an injury where they were hit in the jaw with a, a 
soccer ball or something like that. All of those things I think are really important to the clinical picture. And when I'm going through my exam, I'm not just looking at how the teeth fit together and the occlusion, but I'm also looking at that bigger lens of, you know, how are the jaw joints moving together? What's the postural, you know, implications of the cervical spine? Do they have limitations in, you know, range of motion and muscle palpation? Do you like having all that information? <laughs> I, I do. I do. I mean, but because of my background, I don't know if other radiologists would really be able to integrate right that information into that. But, but I mean, any clinical information is important because it helps me interpret what I see on Chromium CT. Chromium CT is a limited diagnostic tool in, in the sense that it's only giving you the osseous information. So it's not giving you soft tissue information. It can't tell you anything about, you know, soft tissue inflammation or anything like that. That's a clinical exam. And then the uh, diagnostic task, but the, you know, and then of course you, you can't tell you anything about the disc or anything like that, but there are clues to what's going on in the system by how the bone remodels and how it changes over time. Cause like your body is the chronicle of your life, right? So there are your past experiences, your, your patterns of movement, all that is stored in your body both in the soft tissues and the hard tissues. And we both know that in the battle between muscle and bone, the muscle's always going to win, right? So the muscle will affect the bones and will change the shape of the bones according to the function, according to the use of that skeleton, right? So our bones are constantly in flux and they're constantly changing over time. And the skeleton that you have right now is not the same skeleton you had 10 years ago. It's not the same skeleton you're going to have 10 years years from now. So uh, the information you give me, especially as pertains to pain, is very important because it, it helps me make sense of what I see on the cone beam CT volumes because I don't want to read too much into it too, right? Mm -hmm. Like there could be a minor change that may mean nothing or it may be very significant. But if you give me the clinical information, it will help me find the reason, the radiographic reason, if there is any for the, the patient's symptoms. So definitely, please give me history. Give me a lot of history. You, know, you don't yeah. need to fill out the whole report. Like the, Don't fill out pages and pages of history. Just short and sweet to what you think yeah. is the chief complaint and some past history as well. Right. And then I also, you know, I would love to hear your input because I did a lot of training with Dr. Mark Piper on, you know, he has like a very specific like MRI protocol where you're doing different bite registrations. And he had advocated for, you know, something that he calls a fully seated condylar position. So, mm -hmm. you know, taking a bite registration in that position with the cone beam CT and then correlating that with the MRI views in some of those different sequences. What's your opinion about that? Well, I'll definitely, I mean, with, with condylar position, you can determine many things regarding orthopedic stability, regarding the suspicion of a disc displacement, the suspicion of the presence of a soft tissue lesion within the tumor, within the TMJ rather, sorry. And it's important to have the patients have, be in maximum intercustation, you know, MIP, in order for mm -hmm. us to assess where the condyle is in space. Okay, so the concept of orthopedic stability, that's something that I look for. I can't test that 100% from my radiographic analysis, but at least I can see some clues to the presence of a situation where the condyle isn't seated properly. You know, it's all, you know, you have, it's all connected and you've got, two joints in, you know, two TMJs, but you also have joints between your teeth. Like all your teeth articulate to form not synovial joints, but they are places of function, you know, and it's, it all has to fit, right? It all has to fit well in order to keep the function, function and, and the system in harmony. Right, right. Well, and I think what's exciting, you know, as you know, with dentistry, everyone's getting really excited about airway and, you know, kind of the role of, you know, craniofacial growth and development in children. And can we start recognizing some of these signs and symptoms? And I think that, that you know, combining the modern imaging, even for our young patients, you know, if we're starting to see those maybe like red flags, that there could be more 
you know, going on under the surface of, you know, what's happening with the exoskeleton, you know, what's happening with the soft tissue, you know, maybe even before you start orthodontic treatment is, you know, kind of recognizing, you know, are the joints healthy enough to undergo the proposed treatment? Where do we want to land the bite? You know, and so I think that, you know, we have these great tools of just our, like I said, our clinical eye, but also bringing in modern imaging. And so that's where I think everyone, like you're such an essential part of the team of when we're, we're looking at these complex cases, especially in young growing children of where we where maybe we're seeing malocclusions or maladaptations, maybe the mandible, you know, is very retronathic and compressing the oral pharyngeal airway space. And we want to try to, you know, encourage that growth, but I think as dentists, we we get a little bit afraid of modern imaging, and that's what I want to highlight is having someone like you on your team just makes it so essential because we don't want to just put, you know, people kind of willy nilly into like a mandibular advancement device without really understanding, you know, more of the bigger picture, that bigger lens of, you know, what are the joint condition like? What is the cervical spine condition like? You know, so many people, it's like you see their head and it's like over here and then, you know, so talk a little bit about, you know, we had said before we started recording, you know, a little bit about Mariana Roccobato and which I get very excited about the upper cervical spine. So can you talk us through when you get a, a cone beam CT that includes the upper cervical spine, talk us through your process of how you're evaluating that. Okay. Well, well, first of all, remember that this is a limited diagnostic tool. All right. So, and part of this limitation is that when it comes to upper cervical spine or cervical spine in general, you're going to be putting the, the patient in a position according to whatever positioning devices you have, you know, right. So if you, on, on your cone beam CT, there are several options, you know, people can have their chin resting on a chin rest. They can have a, a head strap like Velcro pushing their head back they can have a, a head clamp, ear uh, not really ear rods, but you know there there are several options. A bite stick, and all these are going to change the position of the the head and the alignment of the head. And many people will also turn their heads in the cone beam CT machine. So what you see on the cone beam CT, unless you yourself have determined that the patient is in what their natural head posture is may not be what their natural head posture is. Do you understand? So, so if you don't like, if you, if you send the patient off to this cone beam CT machine for the, the scan with your assistant and they're not trained to bring them or to, to respect the natural head posture, they're probably going to be in something that isn't natural head posture. And with that comes all kinds of issues regarding interpretations particularly, and the easiest one to talk about here is the airway, because the airway is like a collapsible tube. And the, the, the borders of that tube, of course, are the peripharyngeal walls and the tongue in the front and the, sp the cervical spine in the back. So if you are moving your head forward, you're going to be increasing airway dimensions. And if you move your head back, you decrease airway dimensions. And similarly, if any of these positioning devices are used, there's going to be a change in the airway dimensions. And which is why I really don't like to do airway dimensions when it comes to analysis of the airway. It's more of a holistic view of what the facial skeleton looks like, how it's formed, size of the jaw, size of the nasal cavity, areas of obstruction, and that sort of thing. Um, okay, so there's that. The other thing with regards to rotations, okay, if you turn your head a bit, your head, your, your, your spine's going to rotate, right? And similarly, if the patient rotates their head, in the machine, like if they sit down and their head just, you know, or their whole body rotates, then that's going to, that's going to show up as a, a rotation that isn't true, you know, that isn't really what you, what they have clinically. So there are a couple of things that I look for. And when I, when I'm evaluating the cervical spine, when I'm looking at the, the head first, the, the facial skeleton and the, the, skeleton of the skull and all that stuff. I want to make sure that I orient the scan correctly so that I can make sure that there are no asymmetries in the skull base. Okay. And when I do that, that's also going to throw off 
the alignment of the cervical spine. Okay, so there are a lot of things that we'll have to think of when we're, if we're going to make a judgment call on the cervical spine, you know, first of all, how is the patient sitting in the machine? And second is when I perform what I need, you know, the, the, the steps that I need to take in order for me to diagnose the condition of the skull, the contents of the, you know, the craniofacial complex, I will probably need to rotate the skull a bit in, or rotate the scan a bit in order to make sure that there are no asymmetries that may represent pathology. Okay. So with that said, there are some things that I notice, like if you are, I have the head aligned, you know, with the external auditory canals and everything is, is, is symmetrical. If I see that C1 isn't, isn't following the head, all right, then that's telling me something because C1 and, and C0 should be like in the same axial plane, right? But if C1 is off, then that tells me something that there's, there is a malalignment, there, there may be a subluxation, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course, it's wonderful when I get scans from chiropractors because then, then they have everything in natural head posture and it's easy for me to, to make a judgment on how this person is ho really holding their head. But otherwise, you know, when it comes from dentists, I really have to use a lot of suspicion and judgment to, not judgment, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I'm trying to, I need to look at this with a little bit more finesse and, and not make a call on cervical rotations with that. I don't know if dentists, most of the dentists in your podcast would be interested in this kind of thing, but you know, that is, no, that is more, something. More. I want yeah. them to pay attention more. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, of course, the significance of this is that, you know, and we're trying to teach dentists something here about, about this is the contents of the vertebral canal, right? So the con you've got the, you've got the, the, the medulla and the, the uh, and the and also the spinal cord in there, you know, and there are several nerves and ligaments and, and vertebral arteries and all that stuff. And if something's rotated, if the, the spine is rotated, there can be comp there can be issues with with the functions of those of those components. Now, what uh, my, my, your run of the mill general dentist? Why should I care? Well, you know, because we should care about our patients, right? And you you probably won't do anything about it. You, you're probably not going to incorporate it into your practice anytime soon. But at least you can send them off to someone so who, who can help them, who can assess them properly to make sure that they are okay neurologically, you know, also that they're not in pain, that they are stable, right? Absolutely. And that's where, you know, like our, our PTs and our body workers and, you know, being able to like, you know, assess all of those different components of the musculoskeletal system are so like such an important part of our team as well. I think especially when we look at young female patients, you know, they may have some underlying connective tissue disorders, or they may have hypermobility or ligament laxity. Mm -hmm. And all of those things, you know, I think that traditionally we've looked at things if there was pain or problems, but maybe, you know, as we're starting to perform maybe more interceptive orthodontics or more interceptive airway or, or sleep assessments, I think that we also need to be clued into things like migraines or headaches, you know, because, you know, young kiddos may not have necessarily, you know, TMJ specific symptoms. They may have clicking or, you know, joint noises, but they may not have the pain that you'll see like later on through the process. But I feel passionate about like trying to recognize who these young kiddos are. It's, it's almost like kind of having a crystal ball and maybe, you know, changing the trajectory of their lives a bit instead of, you know, a detrimental way. Maybe we can influence that in, in a more positive outcome. Yep. Well, Going back to a point that you made earlier, if you don't diagnose your patients, you don't treat your patients, yeah. right? And that's a very important thing that most of us who go through dentistry, I mean, we can't wait to get to the mechanical part of dentistry, right? right. You know, it's nice to make people's smiles look nice, right? It's, it's nice to right. make people's teeth look nice and to, to make sure that they're healthy in terms of like their teeth and their periodontium and all that stuff. Other issues in the head and neck that may be apparent in, in the teeth. So for example, 
like if, if your patient comes in with a bite change, so if they come in with an open bite, for example, and they didn't have an open bite before, you should be starting to think to yourself, okay, why does this patient have an open bite? It's not because their teeth shifted. I mean, not like under erupted or, you know, <laughs> submerged or ankylosed or whatever. It's, it's something there's, there, there's most likely something going on with the TMJs, with the airways that have precipitated that. And you need to be able to diagnose that. Because if you're if you don't, then you're not going to fix the problem, right? Absolutely. And I think those are some of the red flags that we as general dentists need to be paying attention to more rather than just jumping so quickly into a treatment plan. But like you said, being able to look at you know the skeleton and, and looking at the soft tissue components and before we jump into treatment. So one of the things that I hear, I'm going to just play devil's advocate a bit because sometimes when I talk to other orthodontists or pediatric dentists and I'm telling talking to them about incorporating that comprehensive clinical exam with modern imaging. And, and not everyone is going to have the same imaging, but, you know, if you see in the clinical history that, you know, where you're starting to kind of check the different boxes where you're thinking like, I do want to explore maybe cone beam CT. I, may, I do want to, you know, explore maybe MRI of the TM joints. I do want to explore digital scans of the bite and seeing how that you know, correlates with posture and, and the, you know, the photography as you're watching your patient move and speak and, and pulling all those things together. One of the things that I've, you know, kind of heard is like, oh, no, 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 I would never, you know, have a young child have a CBCT. It's too much radiation. Could you speak to the kind of the risk benefits of, of that? Okay. Well, well, first of all, not every patient needs imaging. Especially in the world of TMJ, we, we all should know this. You know, most of our TMDs, our temporomandibular disorders, our soft tissue, our muscular, all right? And it's not something that you can diagnose using cone beam CT. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we need to be able to look at our patients and diagnose them appropriately clinically first prior to sending them off for any kind of imaging, even if it's a periapical, right? Mm -hmm. We... Every single imaging instance should be preceded with a clinical diagnosis, a clinical exam and diagnosis, okay? Because it's through that clinical diagnosis and suspicions that arise with that clinical exam that you start to think to yourself, okay, so what more do I need? What other information is on the scan or on in this patient rather that I can't find out in any other way that doesn't use X radiation, right? Ionizing radiation. So if you determine that you've gotten all the information you need, then you, you just don't proceed with, with imaging. But if you have some questions and some doubts and your diagnosis is not complete, then you have to go and start to investigate and look with other in techniques, okay, and, and part of that arsenal, part of that toolbox that you have is imaging with ionizing radiation. And that can be intraorals, that can be extraorals, and we're talking 2D, that can be cone beam CT, and that can be medical CT, okay, MDCT, which is much more radiation, but it has its perks as well. Most of us, most of our patients in, in our world as dentists don't need a medical CT. Okay. Now, and of course there are some patients, like I said, who don't need any kind of imaging and there are some patients who need an MRI. Okay. And so that's the first line of defense, you know, that against excessive exposure to radiation is, is that is determine who needs it and who doesn't. That's number one. Okay. Number two. So once you do decide this person ha needs imaging. Which type of imaging are you going to use? And according to your clinical exam, you're going to determine what you need exactly. So you're choosing field of view, you're choosing resolution, okay? And, and these are things that affect the amount of radiation that a patient receives during the imaging instance, okay? So for example, if I had a patient, and I don't see patients, I just see I'm a radiologist, but if I were an orthodontist and I have a patient who I suspect has ankylosis, 
I would choose a smaller field of view that just encompasses that area, that tooth, that area of that, that tooth. And I would have a higher resolution scan. Okay. Because in order for me to make that diagnosis of ankylosis, I need to be able to see the PDL and I need to be able to, or lack thereof, you know, I need to see changes in the surface of the root. So we're, you know, whereas, you know, if you're like, okay, I'm just going to scan them with whatever protocol that I have for airway or TMJ, whatever, then those protocols, because they encompass more of the head, they inherently have a lower resolution because in radiology world and in, in the, in the radiation world, time, the time you spend acquiring the scan means more radiation. Okay. So more time equals more radiation. Okay. So the larger the scan, the more time it takes, the more radiation exposure it is. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that you have to choose what it is that you need to do. All right. So what it is that you, what question you need answered. So if, what, going back to the case of the Dinkalo's tooth, if you were to acquire the entire head, okay, or at least the face at that lower resolution, yes, it's going to give you the information about the tooth, but it's probably not going to be sufficient for that kind of a diagnosis that requires very fine detail because of the resolution is not going to be sufficient. Okay. Another thing to think about is, all right, so your, your, your treatment, you know, as a dentist, as a, as a medical practitioner, yes, dentists are physicians or physicians of the oral maxillofacial complex. That treatment is seven parts diagnosis, two parts treatment planning, and one part actual implementation of treatment. Okay, so you really have to think about the diagnosis. And if you don't diagnose your patient fully, you, you simply don't treat them. Okay. You may be putting a bandaid on an issue or giving them Tylenol <laughs> figuratively. Right. But in the end, in order to help someone find their health, you know, to, to regain their health or, you know, you really in this world of TMJ airway, you really need to ha have a more holistic approach. Okay. And if you don't diagnose the patient, you don't treat the patient. So I'm going to give a, an example here. A patient that was seen by an orthodontist that had a crossbite, started with a crossbite, right? Then the orthodontist, they fixed the crossbite, okay? And then the patient went away, came back 11 years later, crossbite's back. So now they had a comb beam CT made. They didn't have one previously. They had a comb beam CT made. They found that the patient had a, an obstructed nasal cavity, so basically a really large deviation of the septum, large contrabullosa. And it, you know, and I asked a question when I received the second scan. I was like, "Is this patient a mouth breather?" She was, and she was like, "Yes." How did you know? I'm like, "Huh." So the persistence of the mouth breathing habit that should have been diagnosed in the first instance caused the relapse. So once again, you know, if you don't diagnose the patient. You don't treat the patient. And there are many examples that I can give, but we, we don't really have that much time to go on with this. But so for those who are hesitant to use cone BCT, yes, you are, you are right. Radiation is, is a force that you reckoned with for sure. Okay. And we need to be judicious about who we are going to be imaging. But here's the thing. And here's what I truly believe is the harm that you may do by not diagnosing your patient adequately is probably there's a higher risk or a higher likelihood of that harm occurring than, you know, the adverse effect of this minuscule amount of radiation, right? But we still take all precautions and we do everything that we need to do to minimize the dose to the patient, no matter what, okay? But if you can't get your diagnosis any other way, then you need to not be afraid to use imaging, especially cone beam CT. I know that the, the, you know, people are very comfortable using the intraorals, comfortable using the extraorals, but here's the thing. I mean, if you get your pan on your CEPHs and an FMX, that, that almost is the same amount of radiation as a, as a low dose cone beam CT. So. Absolutely. 
So getting to that modern imaging of being able to look at things three-dimensionally, I think it's just such an important tool. And we've seen that, you know, endodontically, whereas you have it at a micro level and now with the airway and the attention to that bigger picture, we also need to, like you said, be judicious, but also not be afraid to use that bigger field of view if it's warranted you know, based on that clinical history with the diagnosis. And that's why I think someone like you is such an important part of the team. So if I have worked up the patient, I want to have you on my, as part of my team. So even as I'm looking at the imaging and assessing that, I want to have an expert like you as an oral maxillofacial radiologist to also be giving an overread to mine. So, you know, anytime if I've ordered a, a cone beam CT or an MRI, you know, obviously the MRI is being read by the, the radiologist, but a, a cone beam CT in a dental office, I'm always including someone like you on my team. And, you know, I think what you're doing is phenomenal and everyone should take your course and read your book and bring in all of those different components to their diagnosis for sure. Yeah. Diagnosis is important, you know? So another thing, another important point that I want to make along the same line as what you just said is that if you can't, if you're not adequately trained to read the Combium CTs, you do have people who can help. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So you do have cone beam CT, uh, you know, people who, who have gone through extensive training, oral maxillofacial radiologists, and, and you can learn to do it yourself too, but it really does require, just like any dental procedure, it requires an incredible amount of time to master it. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. So, I mean, I do offer courses, like you said, I mean, I do offer courses on how to read a cone beam CT to just to help open up the that door that first step of education i do privates as well i help people learn how to do this one-on-one according to what they're trying to learn for their practices but it it really is a lot of time that it takes to go through the scan and adequately diagnose it and write a report so i you know i think most dentists would rather they they do the things that they love doing anyway, you know, the clinical work and, and leave that kind of work to, to us. But of course, it's, all, it's important that both parties, the radiologist and the clinician, are looking at the scan, okay, because they're yes. both responsible for it. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like, who do you think is just absolutely killing it at the education and game of TMD, myofunctional therapy, airway? Who, who do you love in, in that space? Who do you love? Oh, gosh. You know, honestly, everybody brings something to the table. Okay. And and there are so many wonderful educators out there. I can't, I mean, I'm partial to my mentor, you know, David Hatcher, because of his, his wisdom and his foresight, you know, but, you know, anybody, you know, everybody that I've listened to brought something that was of value to me. And I may not agree with everything that you know, everybody says, but everybody brings something. So it's important to, when you, when we listen to people to not be judgmental and to try to find these little nuggets that help you along in your path and your personal path. Right. And, and there are so many different philosophies. I mean, there are so many different ways to skin this TMJ cat. Mm-hmm. So they, they're just, it's unfortunate that there's also a lot of fighting a, a lot of disagreement on wh- whose philosophy is best. And now I'm just going to say there's truth to everyone. And it's just that, that joint and that body, that human body is just so resilient. So that human body has an incredible ability to repair itself. Absolutely. And our treatments, many of the treatments work just because it's, you know, that joint and that system is going to try to do its best to adapt to whatever is thrown at it. But we also have to be smart about diagnosing each and every part and how it all relates to one another. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, tell, tell our audience where they can find you. We'll (laughs) certainly put links in the show notes with your book, the Amazon link. I know that's where I bought it. I think your book is absolutely essential to anybody's library that is interested in airway, TMJ, 
all of these things. I know you're doing a course with Beam Readers, September 16 and 17. Like I said, I did your course a couple years ago and highly recommend it. Well, you know, would love to do more, more one-on-one -on -one sessions just to get, continue to hone my, my skills in, in diagnosing, but tell us a little bit about like your practice as, as well and, and where people can find you. Well, I mean, I, I work from home, so not a very glamorous <laughs> practice model, but it's a very convenient practice model. So you're welcome to visit me in Orlando anytime you'd like. But, but in terms of, of education, you know, I do my education through Beam Readers and I do, you know, give lectures here and there. I, Dawson, I'm, I'm visiting faculty at the Dawson group. You know, I, I'm speaking at Chicago Midwinter this year in February at the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain in April. So, I mean, I, I do get along around. <laughs> but the consistent place to find me for in terms of education is, is really going to be on the Beam Readers website. I'm giving a, another course in August on how to read a cone beam CT. That's a two weekend course. And then of course, my TMJ Airway course, which you thank you for, for mentioning that in September. And also the privates can also be accessed on the Beam Readers website, you know, and I, Wonderful. yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me about this. Like I said, I am such a fan of you and your work. And it's just, I, I try to always stay humble, stay curious and always learning. I'm, I'm a, a CE junkie. So I'm always, always wanting to hear, you know, other people's perspectives. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast and keep, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us on this amazing episode of Jaw Talk with Dr. Dania Tamini. I'm so grateful for her joining us today. I hope you learned a lot about the intersection between oral maxillofacial radiology and general dentistry and how they are such an essential part of our team when it comes to modern imaging. If you found this episode valuable and informative, we kindly ask for your support. If you could leave us a review on whichever platform you consume your podcast, that would be amazing as far as gaining visibility for our show. Also, if you'd like to support the show, please consider joining Patreon. If you join, you'll gain exclusive benefits. This helps directly fuel the growth of Josh Hawk podcast, allowing us to bring you even more engaging discussions with industry leaders like Dr. Dania Tamimi. To leave a review or become a patron, simply visit the links in our podcast description. Your involvement in our community makes all the difference in shaping the future of our show. Thanks for being part of the Jaw Talk family. We're so excited to continue to explore the fascinating world of airway plus myo plus TMJ. So stay tuned for upcoming episodes. Don't forget to follow us on social media for updates and behind the scenes content. Until next time, stay humble and stay curious.